Welcome to In the Archives. I'm Michael Feinstein, and this is the Great American Songbook Archive. It's a pleasure to share some of the treasures that we have in this uh, wonderful space. Actually, I'm going to speak about a, an object that is not in this space. It's in another location because it is a beautiful grand piano which was donated to us by the Richard Whiting family. Richard Whiting was a very important American popular composer who died in the late 1930s, prematurely, only in his late 40s. And he was a man who traversed the era of the early 20th century and became well known for his early ballads and rhythm and wartime songs, songs like Till We Meet Again, and then later in the 20s, The Japanese Sandman. But into the 1930s, he started to write very successful swing songs and created standards all the way up to the moment of his death, with later songs including Hooray for Hollywood and Too Marvelous for Words. He wrote for Shirley Temple on the good ship Lollipop. And his daughter, Margaret Whiting, and her daughter, Debbie, uh, Whiting Bush donated her father's piano, Richard Whiting's piano, and that piano is quite an extraordinary ob object or item, I was going to say, because it not only has the DNA of Richard Whiting's uh, work, he composed a number of hit songs on that piano, but also that piano was played by everyone from Igor Stravinsky to George Gershwin, and it is a beautiful, beautiful piece, and uh, we're very lucky to have it because not only is the piano something that we use and take great care of and maintain and have it regularly tuned and, and, uh, and uh, serviced, uh, we also use it to tell the story about Richard Whiting's career and his songs. And along with the piano, uh, Debbie and the Whiting family donated a lot of other materials that relate to Richard Whiting's career. And that dovetails very nicely with the Gus Kahn collection, Gus Kahn being a lyricist who, uh, who wrote a number of hit songs with Richard Whiting, and as they dovetail together, we can look at a particular song from the materials in Gus Kahn's collection and Richard Whiting's collection, and they go together like this. But I want to show you some uh, ephemera and some photographs uh, that relate to the Richard Whiting piano. This is a photograph of Richard Whiting at the piano. This is probably taken shortly before his passing. Uh, and uh, Mr. Whiting was very facile. He, in the latter part of his career, was under contract to Paramount Studios. And he had to churn out material for them. And the thing that amazes me about his work is that he had such great inspiration and also great variety in what he created, and that he could write practically every kind of song. And it's really quite something to consider that he was writing for three decades because often uh, a songwriter is not able to keep up with the changing styles and times and fashions of music. And Richard Writing was able to do that with great facility. He not only could write a great popular song, he could write show songs. He could write uh, a piece of material for a character and for a score and could write for Broadway. So he was completely unfettered by conventions of music in the sense that he was able to, uh, in such an inspired way, give us so many different kinds of compositions. And most of them happened on the Richard Whiting piano. This is an early picture of his daughter Margaret at the piano. And this is when she was, oh, I'd say maybe 12 or 13 years old, which is around the time that she started singing uh, in public that, that young. This is an earlier picture of Margaret at the piano. And for those of you who don't know Margaret Whiting, uh, she became a very, very successful vocalist starting in the 1940s when she started recording for Capitol Records, co-founded by Johnny Mercer, who was sort of her godfather and the longtime collaborator of Richard Whiting. This is a picture, again, at uh, the uh, aforementioned piano of Richard Whiting's widow, Eleanor, flanked by her two daughters. And this is Margaret, and this is Barbara. And they were both singers, even though Margaret achieved greater notoriety. And they had a television show in the 1950s called Those Whiting Girls, which was a summer replacement for, I think, I Love Lucy, filmed by the Desi Lu studio. Uh, Margaret and Barbara had a friendly sort of competition. Margaret, I think, was a little older than Barbara. And in the period when Margaret started to become successful, Barbara said uh, something like, 
My sister is a singer, she thinks, but I think she stinks. And that became one of the little poems that the family would laugh about and, and recite. This is a picture of the Richard Whiting piano when it uh, had been passed on to his daughter Margaret and was in her apartment on uh, 58th Street in New York for many, many decades. And so uh, you can see the piano through many different periods of its life through these photographs. You see a picture of it in the 20s, 30s. This is a picture of it. Uh, I'd say uh, this is from the 1940s, a beautiful portrait of the piano when it was living in Beverly Hills before Margaret brought it back to New York. And this, from a newspaper clipping of uh, a New York paper, is a photograph of Margaret Whiting in her apartment in New York with her accompanist uh, Tex Arnold. And Tex Arnold, in the last several years, was an important part of our songbook academy because Tex would come every year and accompany the various uh, participants in the songbook academy and occasionally would play the piano, the Whiting piano, and reminisce about it. So uh, at this point, I would like to introduce you to some of the members of the Whiting family who are going to give their recollections about Richard Whiting and the piano. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And thank you especially for taking such marvelous uh, care of this beautiful instrument over the years. My name is Richard Whiting Smith, and my mother was Barbara, Richard Whiting's younger daughter. Now, there's actually a very interesting story about how Richard came to originally acquire this beautiful piano going all the way back to 1915. Richard had been working for Remick Music in Detroit and had wanted a piano like this of such fine quality for many years. He had arranged to trade his share in the publication of a new song that was being written called It's Tulip Time in Holland for the purchase price of this piano. As time went on, it turned out that the sheet music sales of, the, of this work outperformed everybody's expectations by so much. I think Richard probably could have afforded to buy a dozen of them had he just stuck with the standard deal. But anyway, the piano before you is the one that we have, and it went with him through the rest of his career, tragically short, and then eventually moved with Margaret to her apartment in New York, where my first recollections are going back to trips visiting her in Manhattan in the early and late 1960s with my mother and father. The thing that strikes me most uh, remarkably about the thing was the contrast, not only about this instrument, but the environment in which it was in comparison to other pianos I've seen in fine homes in and around Detroit that were mostly display pieces in you know, homes owned not by professional musicians that were there primarily to be dusted and you know, be a display grand piece of furniture, but not a working instrument of working musicians. When we went to see Margaret in the environment where music was actually being created and, and made on a daily basis, just the contrast between the living room pianos and the depth and explos explosiveness of this environment brought about quite a contrast. There were you know, scores all over the place, sheet music, manuscript paper there, really you know, sort of giving a more sense of life of the thing that was actually being used the way it was intended. So that's sort of my first memory of the thing is just the contrast between that and even pianos of similar quality in places that just weren't being used the same way as this uh, instrument that had such a musical history and was actively being worked every day through decades and decades of life. With that, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sanborn, who will share a few more details about Richard's career and Whiting family history in general. It's wonderful to spend a few moments talking about the legacy of Richard A. Whiting and the Whiting family in general. Uh, a brief personal history, uh, I have been very lucky to help keep the Whiting family name alive and well uh, through my cousin Debbie, uh, grandmother Barbara, and of course my father Richard, who you just uh, had a wonderful introduction from. Uh, one thing I wanted to harken back to that Michael referenced so beautifully in his piece, was Richard Whiting's innate ability to write any type of song. And it is really actually very true, and something that is often uh, dismissed of Richard's ability, mainly because of the fact that he tragically died so young and didn't live on to the heights of Harry Warren and Johnny Mercer and many of his other contemporaries. Uh, I have some pieces here that I wanted to share with you just to give a little visual representation of Richard's career. One of his earliest songs, and probably 
uh, to this day, his best-selling piece of music is a wonderful song that Michael referenced, Till We Meet Again, which was uh, written in 1918. Uh, and this piece, uh, by last count that I've actually been able to find, uh, to this day is the best-selling piece of American sheet music ever written and has sold over 11 million copies. And it just goes to show uh, Richard's in incredible ability to write from the mid to late teens going into the 1920s, where he and Leo Robin were actually brought on to be the first songwriting duo brought to Hollywood to write for Talking Pictures in 1928. And they had a string of incredibly successful songs. Every Little Breeze Seems to Whisper Louise, My Ideal, One Hour With You. Uh, the, the list is endless. Going into the 30s, though, Richard really did hit his stride. Uh, one of the songs that a lot of you may remember is On the Good Ship Lollipop, Shirley Temple, it was written in 1934, and again, uh, highlights Richard's incredible ability to write any kind of song. You know, this more of a character piece, uh, often could be attributed more to a novelty type song, even though it was a colossally successful hit for Shirley Temple. Uh, continuing on into the 30s, uh, were beautiful, uh, very melodic songs, I Can't Escape From You, and, and uh, some Billie Holiday hits, Miss Brown To You, and, and uh, a number of uh, very successful Paramount and Warner Brothers pictures that Richard had the ability to score. One uh, film poster behind me, uh, Varsity Show, which was a Johnny Mercer, Richard Whiting musical, one of four that they did for Warner Brothers. Um, the other song here uh, on the wall, Have You Got Any Castle's Baby, which came from this same show, Varsity Show, uh, just as another personal anecdote. Uh, I, I remember as a, as a small boy, uh, my grandmother Barbara telling me it was, was actually her favorite song that Richard ever wrote. So it's just kind of a, a family favorite due to that. Um, moving on to the last part of Richard's life, um, he tragically, as we said, you know, passed away really at the height of his career. Uh, but this piece, which was published in 1938, one of the last songs uh, that Richard saw in his lifetime uh, be released, Ride, Tenderfoot Ride, again, highlights his incredible ability to write any type of song, this being a cowboy picture. So, you know, having all of these pieces in front of you and just showing this, this arc and trajectory of, of his musical ability uh, is, really, is really quite astounding. You know, here's some some you know, little family artifacts just to show you, give you a better sense of things. This is probably our favorite picture of Richard. As a very young man, I'd say he's 24 years old in this picture, early teens. And it was his first publicity shots when he was uh, first started working for Jerome Remick in 1912. It's just a beautiful portrait. Uh, and below this is actually a uh, one of his earliest ASCAP cards, the American Society of Composers and Publishers, where Richard was uh, one of the first members, actually. And we've been an ASCAP family for over 100 years. Uh, a couple other pieces here. Uh, as Michael referenced, the beautiful piano that is uh, lovingly housed at the Great American Songbook Foundation uh, was played by every luminary you could name in the music business, you know, as Michael said, George Gershwin and Stravinsky, um, to show that this is not Richard's piano. This is actually a photo from 1931 in New York. But you can see Richard alongside some of his contemporaries, Arthur Schwartz, there's George Gershwin, um, and the fabulous Jerome Kern, who was another dear family friend, and who Margaret Whiting often called Uncle Jerry. Uh, and uh, she actually recorded probably what is considered the gold standard of Jerome Kern's music in 1960 for Verve Records. Um, bringing it into the present, here's, uh, here's myself and uh, Margaret Whiting's daughter, Debbie, whom you're going to hear from shortly, uh, at Richard's Piano, housed in Carmel at the Songbook Foundation. Um, so this, you know, just gives you a little bit of a sense of some of the things that we treasure here and, and a little history of Richard's music from you know, his first published song in 1910, all the way uh, through the end of his life in 1938, and just the incredible output that he was able to achieve in, uh, truthfully, such a short period of time in uh, 
in relation to many of his contemporaries, uh, a catalog of over 400 published songs um, written by a man who tragically passed away at the, at the young age of 46. It's really astounding. So thank you for spending some time with us here. And uh, last but not least, I uh, would like to turn it over to uh, Margaret Whiting's daughter, Debbie. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Debbie Whiting. I have just moved to Maine and literally am living out of boxes. I don't even have internet. So I am doing a selfie video to conclude the family part of the tribute to Richard A. Whiting. So bear with me. My arm is holding my phone, my cell phone, and I will try to tell you some wonderful stories that I have about my grandfather and my family. First of all, I wanna thank Sandy Sanborn, my cousin for introducing me and thanking my cousin Richard for that lovely story on the piano, which I adore. I also, of course, wanna thank Michael Feinstein, the keeper of the flame, and the reason why I decided it was a great idea to donate Richard Whiting's piano to his foundation. He is a very important part of keeping the music alive. My memories of my grandfather's piano. In the beginning, it just was a piano. And once I recognized what it was, but it was always something to hide under as a child, run around, but there was always someone playing on it and there was a lot of attention around it. I knew early on that I was very lucky to be born in a very special family. As time went on, I heard more stories. And then when I got older, I decided to investigate a little bit more. And I have to tell you, I am blessed. One of the events that really uh, will always remain in my memory were Christmas time. Mother, living in New York, would have tons of people over for drinks and noshes and conversation. They'd always talk about the newest entertainers and some of them would be present along with the traditional stars. But everybody would gather around the piano. Everybody would take turns and play songs, either their own compositions or Christmas carols. And it was a lovely way to end the evening. And that's something I'll always remember. I have to say that the most important thing to me is to keep this gift that I have gotten along with the rest of my family alive to share it with other people so they can embrace what a wonderful part of life and music it was at that time. The Great American Songbook, I fear, will never ever be duplicated and great music will have to be that music. We will have to go back to it. So for the young people who embrace it and want to sing it and make each song their own, I applaud you. Uh, and that is why I have been involved with the Great American Songbook Foundation, that I applaud Michael Feinstein and Chris Lewis and his entire staff for wanting to continue promoting this wonderful music and for the others that want to protect this music. It is so very important. So I applaud all of you. I take my hat off, if I had one on, to all of you. And I hope you enjoy uh, what they have put together to celebrate and to honor the wonderful Richard A. Whiting. Thank you.